Okay, so welcome back uh, to the session. We're moving uh, then to the uh, second paper uh, of it uh, on climate stress testing, bank lending, and the tra transition to the carbon neutral economy. Uh, this will be presented by uh, Hyun Nguyen uh, from the Halle Institute for Economic Research. And uh, the discussant will be uh, Zacharias Zautner from University of Zurich. Um, so without further ado, I give the uh, floor to Huyen. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for having me here. And this is my great pleasure to present our paper, which is still really young, on climate stress test, bank lending, and the transition to the carbon neutral economy. Actually, the first time we presented this paper was also in this room like a few months ago. So today you see like an updated version of the paper that we, we presented three months ago. So this is a joint work with Larissa Fuchs from University of Cologne. I'm from IVH Halle and University of Jena. Chang Nguyen and Klaus Sheck from University of Bristol. So if you browse through like newspapers nowadays, you will see a lot of discussion about how banks price climate and recent risks whether they are responsible for their borrowers who are polluting the environment. So there's also a lot of discussion in the academic literature that show banks did do so. So they do so by, for example, pricing the brownness in the loan contract, or they could also do it by, for example, reducing loans to those brown borrowers. However, the results really mixed because not all banks have the same preferences. Also, not all banks are well prepared for the green transition. So we also have this like kind of the keynote speech also by um, Maria Sunta Gianetti a few months ago that she actually showed that a lot of banks just appear to be green, but they do not really support the grand transition. So essentially what they do is that they claim that they take into account pricing mechanism for the brown loans, but in fact, they keep lending to the brown borrowers. And essentially, in this paper, we will so show that whether the bank supervisors could influence the bank decision to support the green transition. And we also look at whether reducing lending is really an optimal choice or actually increasing lending to those brown borrowers with the purpose that those brown borrowers will then transit to be greener would be a better option. So when we look at the initiative from bank supervisors between 2007 until 2019, we see that there's a huge increase in the awareness of central banks. So the blue line there that you see are the central banks that register to be green uh, network membership. So as of 2019, we have 50 central banks around the world register for that and showing also a skip in uh, essentially after the Paris Agreement. So in this paper, we have really two simple research questions. We use the French climate stress test of 2020 as a natural experiment. We then combine that information with the carbon emission of borrowers and the borrower environmental performance from Refinitiv and also we use syndicated loans from DealScan. So the first question is that we ask, how do climate stress tests affect credit supply and the cost of credit for brown borrowers? We will show you that, first of all, without climate stress tests, there's really limited evidence what the bank do. We, feel, we find that they could reduce credit and ask for higher interest rate, but the results are quite fragile. However, after they participated in the climate stress test, they then learn about the information, how to evaluate their brown borrowers, and then they essentially also learn about the model, what could happen when the central bank do some action that uh, link their loan portfolios to the essentially top bonds in the recent risks. So there we find that stress tested bank actually are better informed and they instead of reducing the loan volumes, they actually increase the loan volume for those brown borrowers. 
And we also find that they at the same time charge higher interest rate because of the risk involved. And later on, we then link this result to the borrower level to ask, so after the borrower receives this additional lending from those threat-tested banks, what do they do? We see that brown borrowers do show some evidence that they improve. First of all, they more likely to commit to carbon emission reduction targets. They have products that are classified as environmental friendly products. So you can think of like go to the bio market and you see some product with like uh, the sticker that say is produced from, for example, recycled materials. Those are the kind of products that the borrowers reported that they they have um, off, an offer. But how when we look at the longer term kind of like behaviors, for example, where whether there are some evidence on the direct reduction in carbon emission, or whether they try to green their supply chain network, for example, by terminating relationship with brown uh, suppliers and instead switch to the more responsible one, or if they actually take into account the criteria related to the environment when they source their materials. However, there we did not find so much evidence. So just some institutional background. I see that um, the ECB also did a bit of climate stress test with the kind of uh, top-down approach. So from last year, the ECB did this exercise and show that we have 65% of borrowers that generate the net interest income mainly for the banks are from actually carbon intensive industries. Uh, for the French climate stress test here, this is more of a kind of bottom-up up approach. So essentially the central banks um, show the scenarios for how much carbon price could increase over time, depending on different scenarios. And then all the banks that participated in the climate stress test, they could use their own data and calculate and calibrate how much losses would that be depending on each of the um, scenarios that got carbon prices raising. So if you see the, the figure here with three scenarios between 2020, 2050, so they take quite a long um, term approach and see the carbon price it evolve um, in 30 years. So the black line show very general increase. So it's not so sharp increase in carbon prices, but the kick of date is quite earlier compared to the other scenarios. In the delay transition, which is shown in the yellow line, this means that we did not increase carbon prices so early, but we started with some small step, but at some point because those um, climate change issues get bigger. So for example, because we have this higher temperature resulted from the negative externality of carbon emission, and we then at that point of 2030, realize that we need to do something else. So then by that time, the carbon prices need to increase even higher compared to the black scenarios of the baseline. And uh, we see a big increase there. And finally, in the accelerated transition, we essentially expect the worst to happen and the carbon prices um, increase already around 2025 and uh, reach around 1,000 USD um, over a ton of carbon. So with these three scenarios, there was essentially nine banking groups in France. They voluntarily participated in this threat test, and then they estimate the losses from those scenarios. So uh, just to be make sure, I just wanted to make sure that the threat test, actually they do consider physical risk from natural disaster as well. But for banking data, they did not have so much data to, to really estimate that. So the physical risk um, was estimated more for the insurance um, group of um, institution, whereas those climate transition risks are mainly done for the banking groups that participated in this. So here, this is the timeline that how this climate stress test works. They did it in between June 2000, between July 2020 until April 2021. And then there's two approach with the dynamic um, balance sheet. There's a long-term approach. And then they also use the static balance sheet, which is 
just look at the loan portfolio of banks as of 2020 um, and then estimate the losses when carbon price is increasing. So this climate stress test actually do not really identify violators like the general climate stress test. So if you think of the, the, the basic, um, the most traditional climate, the stress test that the ECB do is, for example, when the interest rate increase or decline by, let's say, 250 basis point, what happened to the bank? But in this stress test, um, they just look at the carbon price and they just serve as a kind of information production products. So essentially, the banks that participated in this threat test, they learn what would be the kind of model that the central bank look for when they estimate the losses for the bank and also um, the information on what kind of detail on carbon emission of borrowers that the bank need to collect so that they can better estimate the expected loss. In the data, we have all the EU denominated syndicated loans from French borrowers between 2016 quarter one until 2023 quarter two from DealScan. And these loans are provided to French borrowers, but both by French and foreign banks. We exclude all the financial firms in the data, and we care mainly about the lending decision of lead arrangers in the syndicated lending market. So essentially, in for each syndicate, we have like one, usually one to two lead arranger, and then we have a lot of participant banks. And here, because the decision mainly from the lead arranger, so we look uh, through the decision of them. So. For the bank data, we then use data from Bank CompuStat and Bank Focus. We use borrower characteristic from CompuStat Global. And for carbon emission and environmental performance, we then use refinitive data between 2016 and 2022. Later on, we replace our measurement of brownness of borrowers instead of using carbon emission we then also look at the reference environmental risk index that also widely used in the literature, the screen based on pollution news of borrowers. So for example, if uh, total energy would have a pollution scandal, then the risk index um, that reference provided would then going up. And then also we look at the climate risk exposure uh, by actually my discussion, uh, Satna et al. 2022, and then we find the same result there. So the idea of the paper is just we have two group of banks, the treatment group. So here's just summary statistic in our data. On average, we have one syndicated loan has a size of 1 billion euros. So this is really large loan provided to really large borrowers. And each loan has the maturity of around five years and the loan spread of around 225 basis points. In the sample, because we only have like really large uh, syndicated loans and in France between the periods that we uh, can also observe the loan spread, we only have 993 loans given to 46 really large um, French borrowers by 60 EU banks. So 44% of our loans are given by stress tested banks and the rest given by foreign non stress tested banks. So when we move to the borrower level um, analysis, we observe that um, essentially almost 40% of our firms getting loans from threat tested banks. And during our sample periods, they have the carbon emission growth really vary a lot. It's ranging between minus 47% to 112%. So this is our identification strategy. The first step is that we just really do a simple check on how banks price carbon emission risks and whether they change credit supply based on carbon emission of borrowers. So we just regress the loan volume or loan spread uh, of loan L provided bank B to firm F at time T as a function of carbon emission of firm F at the time T minus one. We then include bank fixed effects. Um, we also have um, borrower fixed effects, industry fixed effects, and we cluster our error term at the bank level. In the second step, where we have uh, this 
um, ambition to really evaluate the effect of climate stress tests, we then do this triple interaction in a quite standard difference in different framework. We then regress the loan outcome the same as loan volume and spread based on the interaction, whether the borrower F is a high emitter based on their total carbon emission prior to the climate stress test, which is above the median of all firms in our sample, interacted with the post-treatment period T, and treated B is the indicator for whether bank B participated in the climate stress test. So again, we have borrower characteristic in, we also have um, essentially um, bank fixed effects, loan tie fixed effects, and industry fixed effects included in the model. So after we look at the bank level result, we then aggregate to the borrower um, environmental performance. And here, instead of looking at loan volume or spread, we then look at short versus long-term adjustment in the environmental performance of borrower F at time T. So the short-term adjustment, we will have dependent variable as whether borrower has environmental improvement tools, whether they reported that they have products with environmental responsible uses, and then we see whether they have initiative to restore environment, whether they committed to emission reduction, and whether they pin down essentially one concrete number of how much of the reduction in carbon emission that they would have uh, in the next 20 years. And then we also look at whether they have this environmental evaluation criteria when they do their investment. For the long-term adjustment, this is something that not just they can say that they did, but it's more like concrete number um, of their environmental performance that we, we also could see um, in real time. So we have emission score, total emission growth, direct emission growth, whether they have supply chain environmental policies, meaning that, for example, they will source their um, materials with like environmental criteria, or whether they have the termination with environmentally unfriendly suppliers. So again, here we have this triple interaction, high emitter F gonna be dummy that take value of one if the average carbon emission of borrower F before 2020 is above median and zero otherwise. The treated gonna be that is not at the bank level, this is at the borrower level. So we look at whether borrower F would receive any loan from the stress tested banks the year before. And then here we have borrower fixed effects and time fixed effects um, in the model. So in order to do our um, standard difference and different approach, we have to ask how similar are stress tested and non stress tested bank um, before 2020. So here we have this comparison based on bank characteristic, also borrower characteristic essentially the borrowers that link to treated and control banks how different they are in terms of carbon emission and how different they are in terms of size leverage and profitability so we do not really care about the level differences but here we care about the evolution this means that whether banks and firms evolve in similar way before the climate stress test so we take the difference and then we have this First two columns are the mean and standard deviation of the treated loans. Um, the third and the fourth are the control sample. And finally, we have the normalized difference in difference, which is the difference in mean of treated and control divided by the square root of the, of the sum of variance um, for treated and control variables. So here we see that with the approach of uh, Imbens et al. 2009, the rule of thumb is that if the normalized differences, the absolute value of that is above 0 0.25, then we need to worry about the violation of parallel trend test, whereas any number that is below the 0 0.25 threshold, we can be confident that they involve in a similar way before uh, the, the shock. And we see here that we did not see any violation of parallel trend test. 
So now I will jump to the first result, which is on the bank lending and borrower carbon emission. So there's no um, effect of climate stress test yet. So here we have the loan level information of uh, all loans that we have observed information on maturities, loan amounts, spreads before 2022 quarter two. And the first two columns you see are how carbon emission relate to loan amount and spread on um, loan amount and uh, the third and the fourth are for loan spreads. So we see that for the first column, we have some evidence that banks reduce loan amount and um, reduce by seven percentage point. However, when we control for borrower characteristics, the results goes away. The same goes with the spread. Without the controlling for borrower characteristic, we will see that banks increase spreads for those brown loans. But after controlling for borrower characteristic, we also did not, we could not see the effect there. Now, this is the effect of climate stress test, and I show you the dynamic effects. So essentially, we plot the coefficient on the triple interaction term three years before the climate stress test, and also three years after the climate stress test. You see that before that, all the coefficients are insignificant. Uh, also confirm the result of parallel trend do um, appear in our data. And after that, the banks seem to adjust slowly. So the first year, we could not see any effect. But from the second and the third year, we see that the increased loan amount, but at the same time asking for higher interest rate when the loans are for brown borrowers. Now, this is just the result in table format instead of the dynamic result. And here we see the same way. So the, the first column, we do not control for borrower characteristic. The second columns, we do control for those borrower characteristics such as leverage and size. The third and the fourth also have the same um, structure. And we see here is that treated bank, meaning the bank that participated in climate stress test, they increase loan amount to those brown borrowers by 15 basis point. And at the same time, they ask for 8% percentage point higher in loan spreads. So this means that instead of reducing exposure to the brown industry with the long-term approach, what they do is that they know that if 60% of their portfolios are gonna rely on those brown borrowers, what they need to do is to transition the brown borrowers to a greener one rather than just completely reducing the exposure. So this is what uh, contrasts from other um, results on how banks react to climate stress tests. And essentially here, here we see that um, banks did seem to aid borrowers in the transition to what greener activities, but also adjust risk pricing accordingly. And also just, um, for example, um, my uh, discussion, Jack has a paper that look at actually a lot of brown borrowers, they do those um, green patterning, right? So it's not that the brown borrowers do not do much, but they needed financing to really green their production so that they could, for example, instead of relying on the brown energy, they could invest in technology and later on also uh, getting uh, more ready for the green transition. So this is our heterogeneous adjustment, and we look at so which bank actually do that. So we split between banks that have long-term relationship and banks that did not have the long-term relationship with borrowers, and we see that the banks that give more credit and also charge higher interest rate are usually banks that have relationship with, uh, with the brown borrowers. And finally, I show you just some short result on how this then additional lending lead to changes in firms' environmental performance. The first thing is the short-term effect. We have essentially where the borrowers have improvement tools related to environment. They have product with environmental responsible yields. Also, for example, they develop reduction in carbon emission target, and we see all the results there actually positively significant. However, now if we move to the long-term adjustment, we do not see any improvement in emission score. We have not yet observed any decline or increase in total emission growth. 
and direct emission growth. There's not yet any supply chain policies in place. And if anything, we see actually a bit of, of evidence that they less likely to use material sourcing environmental criteria. So here we have not yet made a conclusion whether this is a greenwashing or whether this is just like something that takes longer time to adjust. So essentially we need to observe a little bit more on this additional lending, whether it's really that the firms only talk the talk rather than walk the walk. So I want, I'm going to skip all the rebuttals checks that we did there. So essentially we use alternative measurement for carbon transition risk and do falsification tests to confirm that our results intact. And this is our next step to really explore, for example, what would be the difference across industry and also, for example, different across bank characteristics. And I'm gonna conclude here. So essentially, this is our paper. We try to be the first to examine the effect of bank climate stress test. And we actually did see that bank climate stress test did make a difference. Instead of reducing loan to those brown borrowers, the banks that participated in those climate stress tests, they increased lending with the hope to aid the borrowers for the green transition. So at the moment, we see some good news, which is borrowers try to commit more into these green initiatives, but at the same time, it takes time for us to then observe whether those additional funding lead to more investment could really be um, the good source for essentially reducing direct carbon emission and also other environmental performance. And I look forward to my discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity to discuss this paper. I'm at the University of Zurich Swiss Finance Institute and have a small ECB head on because I'm a regular research visitor. So if you're at ECB or around, uh, you know, I'll be, I'll be back and be happy to talk to you if we didn't have time to talk here. I'm very happy um, to um, start with a positive assessment, a very positive assessment of the paper. Because if you think about it, it has all these ingredients that we try to put into a paper when we try to make it a hit. Um, so it's an important topic. I think it's fair to say that climate stress tests will become a standard tool in bank supervision moving forward, and rightly so, because it is probably the big elephant out there if we think about uh, the risks that, you know, that, that are there and we don't know yet how they will affect banks. It's carefully executed. Uh, the authors are aware of the identification challenges, many issues that I had when you know starting to go through the paper paragraph by paragraph kind of were addressed as I went along. Um, what I also very much like is that there is a surprising result, right? You all know this, right? You submit a paper to the journal and then it comes back and the, the editor or the referee says, sorry, it didn't change my prior. Why do I care? I knew this already. So here there's really a surprising result because I was surprised to read that actually after the stress tending, they increased rather than decreased lending to the uh, carbon, high carbon emitters and increased the rates. So it does make sense. So there is a plausible channel, last point. Um, it's an awareness channel, an information collection channel that through these stress testing, uh, they're able to kind of understand the importance of climate risks, these banks, and you know, how to, to, to address them in the, in the lending process. I have just 10 minutes, so I'll make three comments, two big picture comments on uh, the interpretation of the results and one uh, kind of more technical comment on the parallel trends assumption. Big picture comment. So there's a key policy issue um, that is addressed in this paper. And the key policy issue, and I should say I work a lot on climate finance, not you know, macro potential things, I work on sustainable finance more broadly. So a key issue that we face in sustainable finance and sustainable investing is that we cannot simply say, oh, let's all you know, stop giving money to the dirty firms. Because these dirty firms need money to get cleaner. As a matter of fact, I don't know if you know these statistics, if you look at the 176 
biggest carbon emitters in the world, they're responsible for 80% of industrial carbon emissions. Right? So it's extremely concentrated. And if we just go out there as equity or debt providers and say, let's stop giving them money, well, how can they make the transformation that they have to do? Because they're responsible for so much dirt in the atmosphere that it's really those companies that we have you know, to support in the transition. Now, this is understood by most banks. If you talk to them, they say, we actually have to increase transition risks because we need to support our clients in the journey to become cleaner. Now, how does that square with all these public demands towards net zero targets and you know, show me that you reduce emissions? It's not so obvious. As it's not so obvious that the best investment product is an investment product that has only clean freedoms. Maybe we should label the high ESG products, those that have a lot of dirty firms in there and where the investors are actually engaging and getting them change business practices, right? So it's similar here. And so the paper touches upon this important issue. So it's critical to identify the right brown firms, those that are willing to do the transition that have credible plans to decarbonize and continue providing them funds and re uh, reduce the funds from those firms that are not uh, willing to, to do this transformation. Now, what the paper shows is that the climate stress tests in France, and just as a side comment, I'm surprised it's again the French, because in a lot of other settings that I've been studying, like disclosure and so on, it was also the French that were the first. And it has to do with the Paris Agreement that I think they wanted to kind of signal to the world we're really doing something before, before the Paris Agreement started or the, the, the summit. Right? So the French climate stress test helped achieve identifying the right firms through so this awareness information collection process. Now, here's a question. So these are syndicates. Banks know each other. They know the borrowers. So if the stress tested banks are better able to identify the right borrowers, why are the others not just following? So how does it hold in equilibrium? Right? So if you're together with other banks, especially stressed at the French banks in the stress testing, and you see apparently they've learned something, they change or do not change lending patterns, not away from the dirty firms, why are the other firms not just imitating this? Right? There seems to be value in this information that they learned. It's a message from the paper. So why are the others not imitating this? So here's my suggestion. Simply provide some more discussion. You don't have to you know, put, put down a model to explain this. That helps us understand what the frictions are that make the control group, in a sense, not imitate, imitate the treatment group. Comment two. Again, big picture comment. And I was very pleased to see on the last slide that you also start thinking in this direction. So, so what are the implications if you think about banks and bank characteristics? Right. So the focus was on the borrowers. But I would like to learn more also from a financial stability perspective about the banks. So far, as I said, mostly at the bank level, at the bank loan level, but important questions are being raised by the paper at the bank level. So do loan, do these loan effects translate into greater or lower climate risk stability of the banks? Treated banks versus controlled banks. Do markets award the changes? or non-changes in the lending behavior. Why do we actually, and that comes back to an earlier comment, assess banks on whether they give net zero targets rather than actually assessing them on the actual changes of the borrowers they continue to provide funding to if it's dirty borrowers? I think it will also provide some nice uh, suggestions for, for, for regulators if we kind of are able to go this extra mile and understand the implications of these stress tests at the bank level. So here are two suggestions. First, I would like to see some more tests at the bank level for measures of climate risk, systemic climate risks. There are measures, the climate war is an example. So show us how before versus after the, the, the stress test, these, these, these measures of climate risk at the bank level have changed. Maybe they haven't. And then second comment, it would be nice to look a little bit at, at the sensitivity of stock returns. And I know there are also some non-listed French banks in there, but of stock returns and how they react to realizations of these transition risks. 
right? So if you believe the narrative that they lend to the better firms with the you know, carbon emissions, but the commitment to reduce them, then you should expect also that if there are realizations of transition risks and there are measures for those, right, aggregate shocks, news coverage of, of transition risks, for example, and other things, that if there are these, these realizations of transition risks, that those banks that were stress tested and kind of adjusted the pricing and the lending should suffer less compared to those banks that didn't do this. Okay, so I have some work with co-authors where we look at this a little bit, where we create a measure of the climate risk exposure uh, of banks. And um, so there we actually do show it does matter how your carbon intensity looks like in the portfolio. So if there are realizations of climate risk, those banks with a big exposure to carbon emissions suffer more, right? it's like a conditional effect. Uh, compared to those firms that have less risk. And it would be very interesting to see whether the climate stresses are having kind of a moderating role in reducing the sensitivity. Last comment. We've seen this, this table too, which is a critical table on whether the parallel trends assumption holds. When I saw the, when I saw the table, I thought, yeah, it's nice, but it's not how I would, you know, usually, and I know there's a great paper that you cited that does that, think of you know you showing me whether the parallel trends assumption holds. it's obvious that there's some selection going on right it's french banks it's french borrowers it's voluntary to participate in the stress test of course there's some selection so rather than you know coming up and say look i do this test with these standardized differences even so you know means are very different and so on right there's no parallel trend just go there and say yes there's some selection going on and describe it and tell us how it may bias your, your kind of different diff estimates. Uh, so simple difference in mean tests, simple t-tests, simple graphs, and then see you know, where are differences and you know, how, how does this affect the behavior. So let me conclude, important topic. Some more work on the interpretation and consequences of the results. That's the kind of stuff that at the end will determine the impact of the paper, if you can say more about this. But you also need to do some more work on the identification issues. And actually, that's the important stuff to make the hurdle at the journals. Right? So number one comment to reject the paper is, oh, I don't believe you know, there's a random assignment, so I don't believe the results, which I don't think is a useful comment here, given that it's such a nice setting. So therefore, you know, try to do a little bit more, be upfront that maybe you know, there are some differences, and we know how they affect the results, and then I'm very pleased. Thank you for the opportunity. Thanks very much, uh, Zafir. Yes. And uh, let's collect uh, some questions from the audience. I already see one hand here up front. Hello. Uh, thanks a lot for the nice talk and the nice discussion. I just wondered if I know they extend the loans and, and they somehow charge high interest rates. So if this really the risk, I wonder if also the risk weights or the the probability of default that they so if they have internal models it should also be reflected so i wonder if you have you have that data as well and you could explore this channel maybe a bit thanks um really nice paper and great discussion as well i really enjoyed both um my question was, I think you said something about the stress test itself allows for dynamic balance sheets after a certain number of years. Could you just say a little bit more about how they do that and how are they modeling this adjustment in balance sheets? Because that always strikes me as like one of the key things in terms of whether this is really a risk to banks or not. Thank you for the paper and the discussion. Um, I was wondering, so these are syndicated loans. So to, at least to my understanding, they are sold usually um, after origination. So I was wondering whether this selling could contribute to yeah, um, the brown loans actually going up. So 
Thank you so much, Jack, for the great discussion. So I just uh, had a coffee with uh, Bjorn, and we actually said that I couldn't ask for a better discussion for the climate change recent risk paper. So thank you so much for that. And also thank you for the great question. So I think I will just go uh, to um, the first comments that you say about essentially maybe I could uh, do something else on also like telling the bigger pictures what would be the real implication so that's on our to-do list um, for the essentially like um, the bank level analysis this is something that I think this really new that I, we did not think about like but this is really something we could do so um, essentially what we could do is like look at the bank balance sheet and estimate the aggregate level of climate um, change recent risks and this is something that really nice addition to to the result as well for the parallel trend i think that uh, yes we could do like heterogeneous checks on for example maybe there are some selection and if we also include the other french banks that naturally they did not choose to participate but they could learn from the other french bank and see how different they are and why didn't they for example have the same result there um so thanks for that and then we have the one um the question on the credit risk of borrower i think so um at the moment we have not had that test yet but we uh, do have the measurement for, for example, financial constraint of firms, and we are in the process of collecting the credit risk um, uh, score of firms, and then hopefully if we can show for also the interaction of those borrower credit risk characteristic with the stress tested uh, dummy, and then if we still see the effect, maybe then this is really from the brownness rather than the other credit risk. I think David raised really excellent question on how do banks then estimate this risk based on dynamic balance sheet. So um, the idea is that the, the uh, French central bank, they did not really um, spell out like what would your loan portfolio look like in 30 years. What they spelled out is essentially this is the carbon prices. So essentially you as a bank have to come up with also different pathway for the um for the balance sheets so maybe for example if they have the internal model that say they would reduce um exposure to those uh, borrowers then the balance sheet would look very different from for example they try to increase the exposure and then provide more funding so this is up to the internal model of the bank and then there are then um, analysis on peer so essentially, if you are borrowers and you come up, uh, if you are the bank and you come up with like kind of too good to be true dynamics balance sheet, then there's always this outlier comparing to the other peers that maybe that doesn't make sense. And then the bank have to adjust based on that. And then finally, on the syndicated loans, I love the question because I have the other paper that talking about how banks tackle carbon and recent risks by selling off those brown loans in the um, secondary markets. And we use this US data. So the difference is that, I mean, this French banks, of course, syndicated loans mean that they can sell in the secondary market, but for European loans is much less likely compared to the US. We could actually control for that because we do observe, for example, institutional um, a participant in the syndicate and then we can see exactly which loan got sold later on. So on the other paper that uh, I work with Chang Nguyen and Isabella Miller, we observe that depending on the level of um, uncertainty in climate change recent risks, the banks, when the change recent risk is high, they're going to take into account that in the secondary market, investors, they kind of like, because of risk sharing, they do not price the climate change recent risk that much. So the bank could really offload those risks. So it is like similar to the kind of divestment that you see in the um, pollutive plants. But here's a bank because they have this brown assets. So what they do is that they just sell off those dirty assets to the secondary market. And if that's the case, we do observe that the chance that they price that brown bricks is less likely thank you okay thanks again uh, 
Uh, very interesting results and, uh, and, and, and interesting discussion, uh, Hyun and uh, Zacharias. We're going to have to move on to the uh, uh, final uh, paper um, on macroprudential policy leakage through firms. This will be presented by Björn uh, Imbierovic, uh, who's at the Deutsche Bundesbank. And uh, our discussant is going to be Francesco uh, Lopez from the University of Roma Tre. Okay, so Björn, uh, the floor is yours. Hey, thank you very much, and I know I'm facing a huge challenge. Uh, I know everybody of you is thinking about, should I pay attention, should I sneak out, as usually people do when they have to run for a train or a plane, it's all good. And or should, should I just silently fall asleep? And uh, I will hope or try my best that you all will stay awake. Uh, but in case you want to fall asleep at some point in time, I have a, I have a wrap up after five minutes, and then you can slowly like well, let's see. So uh, the paper I'm uh, going to present is on macroprudential policy leakage. And you might have realized over the last years, uh, there was some, there's some literature coming up. How can you, uh, how can macroprudential policy leak? And it was just a nice paper published in the JIE where it's about the banks and the non-banks and how you can avoid macroprudential policy, if you will. There's uh, currently ongoing projects uh, with respect to uh, where there might be leakage between different kinds of industries. Uh, and uh, in this paper, we actually uh, look if there might be leakage coming from the firms, so the borrowers the banks lend to. And the paper is uh, joint work uh, with Axel from Bundesbank, Ozzy from uh, the ECB, and Steven Onjena also from the University of Zurich. And so let me talk a little bit about the background and the contribution of our paper. Uh, so we all know that after, the, uh, especially in that room, I don't have to explain too much. And uh, you'll see, I keep it very high level policy wise. You won't see any equations because I'm aware of the time of the day. Um, so we know after the crisis, there was uh, many things regarding countercyclic capital buffer. We want to reduce procyclicality and uh, uh, increase bank resilience. And uh, then the, the, the idea of the CCYB is we want to contain excessive credit growth, uh, uh, but also help during downturns. We want to uh, support credit growth uh, then again. So, and that, but what that requires is that banks build a capital in normal times, which they then can use in crisis times uh, to absorb that. The important thing we will be, which is important to understand our paper better, is the feature of automatic reciprocity. Uh, a very interesting technical word. So uh, it means we want to avoid regulatory arbitrage. And uh, so what we could have, we could have cross-border lending of banks. So you are sitting in a country which introduces the CCYB, well, you have to adhere to the higher capital requirement, but all the foreign banks are coming in and lend more to your customers. So not facing it, well, the regulators thought about that. So they introduced the feature of automatic reciprocity, meaning everybody lending to borrowers in this rest, uh, jurisdiction face the same capital requirement um, in, that, in this jurisdiction. Um, so we asked the question in our paper, how effective is macroprudential policy, which is by definition national, uh, when we have a globalized world? And firms are not just working in a very small single region, but in a larger one. And we know there's a huge literature on the very negative and transitory effects when we look at changes on capital requirements, when we look at bank lending. It's very often the case we look at all kinds of experiments and see if capital requirements, microprudential go up, lending goes down. But then we also know, like, where do firms do the, uh, get, now, get, now get the money from? Well, there are some uh, research showing that there is some substitution going on by banks with lower capital requirements. And especially if you look at the cross-border context, you see um, you have, uh, when uh, there are higher uh, capital requirements, they, uh, so, if banks in a foreign country have higher capital requirements, the foreign banks lend more because they have lower ones. But uh, if there is this, an increase in the CCYB, there have been some papers uh, coming out over the last uh, years showing that actually everybody reduces lending. So now let, let's see um, how do actually, so now we live in a globalized world as I said before. So how do internationally operating firms now react to this national macroprudential policy. And if you look to the literature of uh, internal capital markets of international firms, you see the firms operate globally and they wanna exploit every loophole or use financing advantages as much as possible. 
And you might all be aware of the discussions like where do actually firms generate profits, where they should pay their taxes. Uh, there's a lot of discussion going on on, uh, 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 on an international level. And there is some literature showing that firms go to the lowest tax rate countries. So we all know financing of firms happens a lot in the Netherlands. It's a nice country, but the main reason is obviously taxes. Or when you go to Ireland, uh, it's the same case. It's also when the institutional quality differs or when you have different, level, different levels of financial development. So what we do in our uh, study is how do the funding structures of multinational firms, so internationally operating firms, actually change when external borrowing constraints increase? So the CCYB changes. Um, so, and this is the summary slide I was alluding to. So uh, when, uh, after I'm done with that slide, then you can for, so, <laughs> just lay, lay, lay back and relax. Um, so what we find in the paper, the question we ask is, what's the effect of a larger CCYB on lending in general and on risk. And we look at the lending of banks and we look, so we have a setup. We are coming from a German perspective, coming from Deutsche Bundesbank. Uh, so we have the data on that, which is uh, the most granular, I guess. Uh, and we look at cross-border lending of German banks. And we see if a country introduces or increases a CCYB, the cross-border lending decreases by 8.6%. We also can see what happens to non-banks while well, there's nothing going on makes a lot of sense given that the CCYB doesn't apply to non-banks. So non-banks do not change their lending to uh, firms uh, in countries where there's a positive CCYB. We also look at the risk of the portfolio. So what is the change in PD, probability of default? And we see that is kind of important to distinguish between the separate firms because you see it's heterogeneous. On the one hand, the probability of default to the country where the CCYB is in place goes down. So the subsidiary firms abroad, uh, the, the PD is reduced. However, on the other hand, and this is the important thing, which we will delve in much deeper uh, in, the, uh, in the later parts of the paper, is the PD of parents is going up. So something is going on here internationally, and that's the main question of the paper. So we look at, do the affected subsidiaries then in the CCYB countries <laughs> substitute the bank credit by just asking the parent companies, can you maybe lend us something? And this is exactly what we find. We see that they increase their lending by roughly one third compared uh, to the period before. And we also check, is the credit substitution complete? And we find, yes. So eventually, there is an introduction or an increase of a CC by B in, in the, an internationally operating firm has the same leverage. So there's no change. Just the money comes from somewhere else. In the case, what we show, it's coming from the parent company abroad, which is unaffected. Uh, now, the big question is, the parent company has to lend the funds, so it has to get the funds somewhere from. Where do they get it from? Well, they simply go to their domestic banks and increase their borrowings, and they go to their domestic non-banks and increase their borrowings. So they, you see here, there's a shift going on, uh, which is an international shift. So obviously, now banks lend more in countries which had nothing to do with the change in CCYB and the other countries. Um, now, the question and we also ask is, is there general risk shifting going, uh, going on? And this is the thing we cannot really uh, uh, confirm because we observe that banks and non-banks, so uh, uh, the, uh, on the domestic side, pay attention to the risk of the parent. So do not just simply replace, but actually account for the risk. And this then also confirms our mechanism because the riskier parents lend less to the substitutes which are affected. Okay, that's already everything in a nutshell. So the contribution of our paper is, um, we, what we observe in the paper is when there's a change in CCYB in one country, it might also have an impact on other countries. And especially, and this is important for policymakers, when the macroprudential policy stance is heterogeneous across countries. So I can already like allude to the conclusion. The conclusion will be if we had the same CCYB everywhere, we presumably would not observe the effects we would observe in the paper. But that's not the case. Um, so we see that there is a decrease in cross-border bank lending and a decrease in risk to the affected countries. So the country is increasing the CCYB. However, there's also an increase in domestic bank and uh, uh, bank lending and also an increase in cross-border firm lending to the subsidiaries and also an increase in risk of the banks lending domestically. So macroprudential policy might leak through the international structures of firms. And in that little picture here, you see, uh, so uh, at the bottom, you see this uh, the little problem at the bottom, you see 
banks are lending less crisp cross border, but then you also see that we have an increase of this 30 of one third that the firms lend to their subsidiaries. Okay, let me briefly uh, talk about the data we use. So we use internal Bundesbank data, uh, which has the limitation, everything is from a German perspective. And ideally, of course, we wanna have a global sample and know everything. Well, we don't. So we have to go what, what we have, but we have very nice data. So we have something like a credit register, and I already uh, talked to uh, my discussion. Um, the credit register comes with two caveats. One is we don't have individual loans, we have credit exposures. So in each quarter, we know how much a bank lends to a specific part of a firm, but we don't know the, so, so the, the exact new loans or uh, repayments of loans, and we don't have prices also in there. Uh, but the, oh, the, the nice thing is we have the probability of default of each firm uh, included, so it's the estimates. And then the even nicer part, well, I personally think what makes it really unique, we have very granular data on German foreign direct investments. So as soon as you borrow from a bank located in Germany, well, they have to report the entire structure of the corporation. And this is a mess of data, but it's very nice because you, because you see internal capital structures. You see how much one subsidiary lends to another subsidiary or to the parent company, which helps us here to uh, figure out the effects we observe. So we used to set up that we have a parent company in Germany, which land, uh, and, and, uh, and uh, which has subsidiaries abroad, uh, so outside Germany, and have detailed information on the limited liability structure. So we use data from 2013 until 2019. Overall include 30 countries where, of course, not everybody uh, had a CCYB. And you see here, we have quite a nice uh, fraction, so the number of lenders and the number of borrowers. So there's a lot of heterogeneity in the data. So this is uh, what happened until 2019 when you look at Europe with respect to the CCYB. So uh, I, I re received, once received a, a question from somebody outside. So isn't it all homogeneous? Well, we as most policymakers here in the room know, know definitely not. And the beauty for us, <laughs> to some extent here using this data, is Germany didn't have a CCYB until the end of 2019. So we were unaffected. There was always discussions going on. I know like from internal <laughs> discussions, but we, we just didn't make it until, and then there was COVID and we just introduced it and immediately released it. And uh, now we, we are not even at 1%. So, and then you look at other countries where you see like Norway, we're at the forefront of introducing CCYBs. And uh, then also uh, Sweden were among the first, so the Scandinavian countries and other followed in, but there's lots of heterogeneity uh, between the different countries. And overall, as, is, as I said, we have overall 30 countries uh, included. So the first question we ask is, what's the effect of the largest CCYB on the borrowing from banks and from non-banks and also on the probability of default of borrowers? And uh, so this is basically all the same, but just with varying degrees of fixed effects. So if you have questions, look at the fixed effects. We saturate in a lot um, to get rid of, of many potential problems we might face. And we see this year is at the bank country level. So we aggregate all lending for the bank at each uh, to, to each country it lends to at each quarter in time, and then just said, look at if there is a CCYB in the country, what's the change in lending? And you see here, uh, on the even on the aggregate level, the lending decreases when you increase the CCYB. Uh, technically, it's a diff and diff with uh, a varying treatment timing and varying uh, treatment intensity for those technically interested. Um, what we then do, we look at the uh, bank firm level, and the firm level here is the subsidiary. So this is just cross-border lending. So outside Germany, and it's a single bank to a single subsidiary at a certain quarter time level. And you see here, if you increase the CCYB, also here it's confirmed, it, if the CCYB increases, it reduces the cross-border lending of banks to countries which increase the CCYB. So an increase here of one percentage points in the CCYB means a decrease of 13.6% in bank lending to a customer in this country. Now, uh, we also look at non-banks um, because it's included also in our credit register. And the big question is now, what do non-banks do? And many people claim, well, they take over and so well. What we observe, having a very clean setup, they don't change their lending at all. And yeah, why should they? They are not subject to the CCYB. So you might think that they might be taking over. It's not what we observe. 
But a word of caution, and I've, some people th would, would throw everything in one pot. And of course, what happens? If I use a dummy here on non-bank, the relative effect would be positive. People doing this in a different diff, and yes, I've seen papers like that, would conclude, oh, the non-banks are uh, doing much more lending after CCYB is introduced. No, it's a relative effect. There's just, no, if you do a fair comparison, at least from our perspective in that special setup, if you will, we don't see any change in lending from the non-banks. We then also look at the risk of, uh, of lending. So we know, um, uh, we know from the literature, so from, from the micro literature, that there is actually the capital requirements are going to some extent with, uh, towards lending, but very often they go towards risk weighted assets. So the risk is a very important thing. Banks might not really change the lending, they might just change the risk structure of borrowers. So uh, what we also check is what's the change in probability of default and lack of risk weighted assets. So what we see here, uh, we aggregate the data to the bank country level. So take the average PD in a country a bank lends to. Oh, at, at each specific point in time, and then check like what's the reaction when you increase the CCYB. And we see at the aggregate level, the probability of default to uh, lending to of borrowers where you lend to this country decreases. We then, of course, also do that at the bank firm level. And also here, when we throw everything on one pot on the first four columns, you see it's a negative effect. So I increase the CCYB in a country and the average PD of borrowers goes down towards this country. Now we do a little split. We, we just look at the subsidiaries. And the important thing here, technically, it's within MNC, so multinational corporation. It's like this one international firm, like Siemens. And now we compare all the subsidiaries within Siemens with the same lender, so MNC times lender fixed effects. And here we ensure that both subsidiaries and parents receive loans from the same lender at the same point in time to really make a comparison possible. What you see here, the subsidiaries actually have lower risk. Well, we now also split it with the lenders. So now the MNC fixed effect here becomes a firm fixed effect because obviously there's just one firm in an MNC and I just kept that for ease of illustration. Uh, but what, when you compare the parents and it's not the exact same comparison, we, can, we, we cannot use the firm times bank times time fixed effect because that would be fully saturated in. But if you use a little bit uh, 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 more, uh, less granular comparison, you see, if I just compare the parents, if I have an affected subsidiary, I have a higher probability of default when there is a CCYB for, introduced for one of the subsidiaries. So the following questions were then about the, where does that come from? And this is also one of the reasons why we dig deeper into that. So the first question we asked is, What's the effect if you have a CCYB on the international funding structures of multinationally operating uh, firms? And well, MNCs have the very easy thing with what they could do. They could always circumvent when they find unfavorable financing conditions, they can always circumvent these or try to circumvent these. They can shift their borrowing to unaffected firms in the multinational corporation. So if their CCYB is going up in Sweden, you could always say, well, why don't you go to Germany and borrow there, maybe funding costs have changed to some extent because of the change in capital requirements. And then you use your internal capital markets and transfer the money from Germany to Sweden just internally where no CCYB is in place uh, so, uh, within the firm. So what we do in our analysis, we look at if unaffected parents lend more to affected subsidiaries and if this substitution is then also complete. And we indeed find that no matter how you slice it and dice it, it's like the internal debt from appearance to total assets increases by roughly 1% or by total liabilities by 2.4%, which means overall an increase by one third, meaning that the, the internal debt from parents to affected subsidiaries increases when the, sub, uh, when the CCYB increases. Now we also check, what does it mean for the capital structure of the subsidiary? So is there any change? Well, if you're an international firm, what you see here is there's no change with respect to total liabilities. And of course, we also look at other funding sources, like for example, are there other unaffected subsidiaries lending? We don't find that confirmed. And we also look at 
not perfect, but a little bit gross, uh, gross measures on uh, uh, capital markets, but we have more information available and we also don't see any change over there. And therefore we conclude that the substitution is complete deriving from the substitution of credit away from banks towards uh, the, uh, uh, the parent companies. Well, now the, back, the next question is, if the parent companies provide the funds, the big question is, though, where do they get the funds from? And they are now located, in our case, in an unaffected country, which is uh, Germany. Now, well, they just approach their banks, and when they have an affected subsidiary, well, they uh, increase their lending by 5% from banks and 13% from non-banks. So they use all the funding sources they have available, if you will, so the ones they used before, and just increase the lending. And then now think back, think back of the result we had when we compare parents with affected subsidiaries to those which do not have affected subsidiaries. There was an increase in risk. Well, there you go. That's where it's coming from. The increase in risk is simply because the parent companies seem to uh, assume more debt from banks and from non-banks, and this is then, is then having an effect on their probability of default. Now, we also look a little bit deeper if there is risk shifting going on. And this is especially to also verify if that's really the mechanism, what we have in mind, if that's also confirmed in another setup. And what we uh, look at is, is there actually just a landing by banks and non-banks where it's just like the parent saying, well, I have a, uh, I have a, uh, a affected subsidiary, CCYB has increased, lending is less advantages. Uh, can I get more, more money from you? Or is the banks, are the banks and the non-banks differentiating by the risk of the parent or not? And what we find is that actually, yeah, so the domestic banks, so here's like, okay, that's not too much, presumably uh, a problem in terms of risk, because you see, if you are a riskier uh, parent company, you also receive less from the banks and you receive less from the non-banks. However, as you know, you have to put these two together. Now let's have a look at the distribution of probability of default. And these are usually pretty small. So uh, when you look at the uh, distribution of PDs, what you would need here is a PD of 2% to just have a zero effect and here a PD of almost 4%. Well, the average PD of a parent is 0.5% or the median is 0.25%. And there is a quite large standard deviation. So very few parent firms maybe do not increase lending from banks and non-banks but most do. This is at least what is statistically shown here. But nevertheless, banks and non-banks still pay attention to the risk of the parent. And yeah, well, that's good. Um, so we also would like to ensure, is this, can we confirm our mechanism? So is it really that parents lend to subsidiaries? So if riskier parents obtain less additional funds from banks and non-banks, we would assume that they also provide less funds to their affected subsidiaries. And that's exactly what we find confirmed. So you see here, so they provide larger funds to their affected subsidiaries. However, this decreases in their PD. So if the, 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 the risk is going up, they obtain less bank and non-bank credit, less additional bank and non-bank credit, but also provide less bank credit internally to their affected subsidiaries. And this has nothing to do with the probability of default of the subsidiary but it's really related of the, to the probability of default of the parent company lending to that subsidiary. So, uh, yeah, so we do not really find substantial risk shifting going on. Uh, they still pay attention. So let me conclude. Um, we have reciprocity rules, and these seem to limit leakages by containing as excessive bank credit growth to a CCYB country, so especially in the cross-border con context. However, we have multinational corporations which have the ability and also do so that they circumvent the CCYB requirement by using internal capital market. And this then again increases credit growth again for the cross-border lending bank uh, through more credit uh, to, fir uh, to uh, firms and countries which, which have either no CCYB or especially a lower CCYB. So we can conclude from the findings in our paper that macroprudential policy might leak through the international capital structures of uh, firms. And I think the important policy conclusion of our paper is 
uh, well, we need less heterogeneity in CCYB, or put it in positive terms, we need more harmonization of countercyclical capital buffers among all the countries. And we have basically almost all uh, European countries in here. So I think that's a very important takeaway for policymakers harmonize the CCYB, and you do not presumably observe kind of these leakages we observe here in the paper. But of course, and looking ahead to the, to the discussion, some words of caution. We have a special setup here, right? We have internationally operating firms. We have a perspective just from Germany that might be substitution of bank lending from somewhere else. So the, especially the effect of the CCYB on standard loan firms might be different, and we have very important firms, I think, by internationally operating firms. And these days, almost every firm is internationally operating. But of course, firms just being located in one country might have uh, might experience very different effects. And second, second is we are currently very silent on potentially longer term treatment effects. So what we observe is you have more credit growth in low CCYB countries when there is a change in CCYB in other countries. And this, of course, might change everything again, because this increase in credit growth might then, the domestic part in our setup, induce an increase in the CCYB, which might lead to a reallocation. Would be very interesting uh, for future research, but we don't go that far. So thanks a lot for your attention. I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. Yeah. Very clear. Uh, uh, um, Francesco, the, uh, the floor is yours. So, uh, it's definitely a very well executed paper. Yes, this is the one. Thank you very much. <laughs> so, I'll, I think Bjorn did a great job in discuss, uh, in uh, explaining his results, and it was very detailed. And I know I'm the only one standing between you and the exit door, so I will not spend much time explaining their results. Uh, I just want to, I mean, so I have three sets of comments. It seems long, but it's, it's not. <laughs> so, the first one is about contrastive capital buffer, I think. I mean, of course, with this audience, you don't need to explain much about how they are constructed, how they're built. But I think in the paper needs a little bit more discussion on the details in about how this should affect lending, in the sense that what we have with uh, what we have with uh, cap capital buffer rate is that some additional capital requirements that goes through the risk weighted asset. And we know that the risk weighted asset basically can be different between products, between companies. So I think, I mean, explain this heterogeneity within bank. I know you don't have uh, you don't have data about specific products, and I discovered this at the coffee break. But maybe you can like try to leverage some different kind of exposures. I don't know to which granularity your data goes, but um, I mean. For instance, you, I mean, my idea, the idea was to basically look at the different kind of absorption, the different capital, different kind of weights that each exposure might have based on the LGD or this or the the like collateral the company. Ha, I mean, pledge on on the on the loan. These sort of things that basically would change the capital, the capital, the, the risk weight, and then could basically uh, make bank tilt the lending towards specific products when the when the counter cycle capital buffer of specific country goes up and uh, um, yeah exactly so the, this so a bit more discussion about the counter cycle capital buffer would be would be great then the second the second point is about the credit register so again I didn't understand, initially I didn't know why you aggregate a loan at the borrower level but then I discovered that that's because the only thing you really really have uh, as, so it's, I, I, I thought it was possible to have like individual loans. This would basically allow you, I think you can still do that looking at the changes. I mean, I, initially I thought about the date of the origination of the single loan, but if that's not possible, maybe you can see when the, when the lending to a specific company changed quite substantially and try to see and, and try to basically uh, rebuild a more standard like difference in different setup in which you have the change in the lending to support toward a specific company or subsidiaries in countries where there's a change in the capital buffer you know because you have two two levels in the in the country capital buffer you have the levels and you have the change the changes within the country right so you could potentially focus only on the changes so this would allow you to put like country fixed effects because i mean you have saturated your model with many many fixed effects but there is no country fixed effects and basically so that means that you're also looking at the like heterogeneity across across 
countries it would be nice to also focus on the like changes in the in the rate within within each country and also i mean if you have data about off balance sheet you know that of of course uh, of balance sheets tend to have lower absorption i mean in, in terms of risk weights compared to standard loans or standard lending so this my also way my also lead banks to tilt basically they, their their exposure toward of balance sheet which might have some kind of some kind of interesting i mean um implication for uh, stability and the final one so identification again i i think i've just already mentioned the first one um so the, the adding country fixed effects would basically uh, Help, would be helpful to understand whether the identification comes from the cross-sectional difference between countries or the difference within countries on the increase in the rates. And uh, um, in the second part, when you show that basically there is increase in the intra-group, which is, I think, the substitution effect is, a very is the very center of the paper. I think it's very interesting, I mean, and it's something that is really new. So I was wondering if you can say something more about the kind of products that, I mean, the kind of lending that, is, that they had, I mean, the, the head gives to the subsidiaries, like is this commercial credit, is this, which kind of, which kind of uh, lending we're talking about? It's, uh, it would be very interesting, once again, to understand better we, uh, this, 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 the product that basically are uh, transferring within the same group in order to understand if there are some implications for financial stability. And um, yeah, uh, once, once again, again, I already touched on this. I think it's uh, it's uh, you, you use the probability of default because probably is the is the um, only data you really. I mean, is useful. I mean, you have data for a big chunk of your sample. I don't know this, but uh, the point is that I mean, the 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 PD is important, but also looking at the LGD, also looking at the collateral, and probably you have some information whether the exposure is collateralized or not. And this would affect, of course, again, the risk weights. So it would be important to try to, to work a little bit more on the kind of trading. So in my view, to conclude, in my view, the center of the paper is really the substitution effect. So this is what is really new. We know that the counter cyclical buffer work, work and we know that um, there is this kind of substitution effect from the bank side, but we didn't know about the fact that that basically companies can use this uh, internal credit to, sub to, to substitute bank credit. And this is a, the very new part, I think, on your paper. And it would be interesting if you can build up a little bit more on the products that you use to, to do the substitution, the kind of, uh, and the implication for financial stability. Because I think this is, this is something that is uh, a bit uh, missing in the paper. I mean, which, it was a great paper, but I think it's uh, this, this uh, saying so, something more about financial stability, implication for financial stability would basically increase the contribution. But thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you very much, uh, Francesco. Um, so let's again see whether we have uh, questions from the floor. I see uh, three, four hands shooting up already. <laughs> uh, perhaps starting on the left here, Denise. It sounded like you were hoping there would be less questions. <laughs> Okay, uh, so let me let me be quick. Uh, very very interesting work. Uh, it reminded me a little bit of this discussion uh, in Hong Kong, when there was you know housing booms, house price booms, and when it was being financed by banks in Hong Kong, it was a concern. When it was driven by cash buyers from mainland China, Hong Kong supervisor could just say, well, it's not my banks on the hook, so I don't really care, right? There's affordability question, but whatever, that's a different question. So it just reminded me of a little bit, um, I'm applying the CCYB and I'm still getting the credit. The subsidiaries in my country are still getting the credit, so activity is remaining, fine, but the risk is elsewhere. I don't care. So it would be nice to hear what your thoughts about that. Complementary question. So first, the fact checking. Uh, it might be my fault, but in the end, I didn't really understand. Do you look only at lending from German banks and non-banks? Okay, so that was this credit registry. Uh, so that is like a, then two two questions, like a, which are more conceptual. So the first question would be: Does it work in reverse? 
So can subsidiaries of companies uh, serve as conduits, conduits for, uh, for, let's say, avoiding CCYB in a domestic country? And I say like a why I kind of uh, think on those in those terms. Because it's like when you run some sort of uh, regressions also for euro area banks, what you find there is a substantial home bias. So essentially the sensitivity to credit, like uh, to capital requirements seems to be higher once those capital requirements affect subsidiaries or something abroad, lending abroad. So it might be some asymmetry if you increase CCYB in Germany. I know that you have only one observation in this case. So does the increase in Germany can trigger the reverse process of getting credit by a subsidiaries of companies? So that would be the, the first question. Uh, it's not clear. Yeah, okay. <laughs> there, just, there, there just wasn't a CCYB increase in the time period. No, you didn't have the zero no. twenty twenty five. No, they want to do it. They announced it early in nineteen, but they there wasn't. They didn't do it in the end. Okay, so go, go on. And then the other question would be about SRB. So you have SRB in a few countries, uh, in the same period, in some of the countries in which the the credit was given. And this, yeah, I know that this is not necessarily on the domestic credit, but maybe some map mapping. To which degree you have subsidiaries of German, com like a German banks there, and to which degree branches or direct cross-border funding to those uh, German branches in different locations, and maybe something on SRB and reciprocity of this capital. It could be a super extension of your paper. Um, I had the question whether you check whether there are different effects, whether that subsidiary is in a euro area country or in a non-euro area country, because I could imagine that it's much easier to substitute sort of the, the lending if your, uh, the firm subsidiary is in a euro area country, because there might not be any currency mismatch. And also revenues are in, in euro if the German bank then or the German bank lent to the parent and they pass on the euros, no, no additional risk. Whereas, let's say, I don't know, if it's in the US or, or some other country, that might be much more difficult to, to substitute because you have additional risk. And if you find that dif differential impact would even increase the argument that within maybe the euro area, it's even more important because potentially the, yeah, this multinational substitution effect might be more relevant. I, I was uh, just wondering how you can explain the fact that there is no substitution of banks to non-banks in a domestic country, while you see that um, non-banks are extending more loans in the, the foreign country. How you can explain that, or what would be your explanation to that? So you mean why they do not increase the non-banks? Yeah, why you did, why you uh, you found a zero percent increase for domestic non-banks, and I think a thirty percent increase for non-banks in the country of the parent. Oh, no, the the thirty percent increase is the multinational firm. The parent lends to the subsidiary, just industrial firms, no financial intermediation whatsoever. So it is the banks reduce lending, the non-banks don't change anything, and the firm inside in the capital markets they lend instead of the banks so the parent firm siemens germany lends to siemens Sweden. that's what we find thank you very much this is uh, very eye revealing and fascinating i never knew of such effect it would be interesting to know what is the scale of this in terms of the total portfolio and uh, what is the motive for banks to engage in that activity if they are not capital constrained? So 
So uh, first, I would like to uh, thank you, especially Francesco, for, for a very interesting uh, and definitely helpful discussion, and also for all the questions. So it's the first time we're presenting the paper, and I have to say, there are still many things we have to do in the paper, uh, and we, we wrote it to put it together in the very last minute, and we're so happy uh, that we are allowed to present it here. Um, and, and I agree with, with many of the, uh, of the points. So uh, why would uh, banks do it? Uh, well, it's the parent asking, I would need more money for my subsidiary. So you just replace it. But we also show you do not just do it because all of a sudden there's, a, there's more uh, risk going on, it's just like because the parent asked for it. But then you look at general credit risk and see like you are in need of further funds. So I lend more, but I pay attention to the risk. If you are riskier, I give you less. I think this is just general loan demand by, by the firms in response to a CCYB um, abroad. Um, there were uh, SR, SRBs in, in, uh, in place in, in certain parts um, of the countries. That, that's true, but we try to abstract from these kind of things by using bank times time fixed effects in almost all regressions. I mean, that doesn't fully address it, and it's a very in, uh, interesting, uh, in, interesting point, and we might look into that, um, that it would be fascinating to even find further. Currently, we, we saturated away, to be honest. Um, Looking at the same currencies, absolutely. It's it's uh, top of my to-do list. We currently have just European firms to keep it as comparable, but then, of course, one of the first countries is Norway, and Norwegian krona has changed, changed substantially, like right, oil prices and all the like, over the last decade. So uh, we, we definitely uh, have, have that on the list on, on the top. Um, in Hong Kong, uh, the, the argument, well, now the problem is somewhere else. That seems to be kind of the case, yes. On the other hand, we are showing that it's not necessarily risk shifting. So there is more lending in, a, in an uninfected country, but you lend less if the risk is larger. So it's not just blindly increasing in an unaffected country. We find a full substitution, but uh, so far it, it, it's not just that the risk shifting going on caused by CCYB in another country. So here I, uh, I can caution down. Um, yeah, talk, talking more about the implications of uh, financial stability, absolutely, you're running through open doors, as we say in Germany. Uh, absolutely, we have to discuss much more. What does it actually mean? Also, in the aggregate level, there was a comment on what does it mean on the total level of banks' portfolio? Well, it's cross-border lending, which is usually some fraction. Uh, in Germany, it's okay-ish regarding size. Of course, it's tiny regarding domestic lending. And we, we have to still put numbers on the, on the overall economic effects and of the overall international implications. I, I fully agree to that and uh, we'll look into that. Regarding, um, we cannot control for country, well, we have firm fixed effects that controls each firm in each country, so that, that shouldn't be a problem. Um, but we cannot look at individual loans or the products of the loans, and I would love to look at loan commitments. Uh, I fully give you that. Uh, that's a very nice comment. We just don't have these data. Okay. So <laughs> they're, they're, this is uh, the caveat. Uh, but yeah, we definitely uh, will look more into that. And uh, thanks so much again. It was very, very helpful. Okay. Uh, thanks so much, um, uh, Bjorn and uh, uh, Francesco, uh, once again. Um, before uh, we uh, close the proceedings here, uh, let me. Um, just uh, make a uh, you know say a couple of uh, uh, very brief um, uh, words. Uh, first of all, <clears throat> you know, uh, thanks to the audience for for sticking around and 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 for being here all throughout. I think we had a great interaction. Uh, there's also been um, uh, audience online. I'm told uh, up to 400 uh, participants have been. Uh, able to join uh, the various sessions uh, online. Um, uh, we are also uh, planning to put the video recordings of uh, the whole two days on the website so that um, everyone who might have missed the session can can go back to the recording and and uh, and, and catch up on those uh, on those sessions. And those recordings will join the uh, powerpoints uh, and also the papers that are already. Uh, populating uh, the website, right? Uh, second uh, uh, remark uh, uh, is I want to uh, very much uh, extend my, my thanks to uh, the uh, co-organizers here at the uh, ECB, uh, Angela, uh, all of them uh, here in the room, Angela Mataloni, 
uh, Markus Behn, uh, Stefan Fahr, and uh, Livio Straka uh, for uh, organizing this and for the excellent uh, collaboration uh, throughout uh, the several months, I think, <laughs> that it took us to put this, uh, put this on. Um, and um, uh, a big thank you also um, to uh, all of the organizational support here at the ECB. Uh, I want to mention uh, Christine Wehrheim, Nicolina Mihili, Stefan Seitz, uh, Anja Sinsch, Franziska Falkenstein, and uh, Vera Rosenthal, uh, and all of the technical and organizational support staff uh, that have made it so that the conference really went so smoothly uh, throughout. So a big hand, I think, uh, to, uh, to these uh, co organizers. And that's, uh, yeah, that's, that's it. Uh, I uh, thank you all for, for coming and uh, uh, wish you uh, a safe trip uh, home.